Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the FCC. Please continue enjoying your lunch. I'm starting a little bit early today because we have the pleasure of having two speakers for the price of one. Uh, <laughs> And they will be talking to us about the quite phenomenal election result that we saw in Malaysia this year in, in, in a time of so many bad news developments, kind of bad shocks where kind of crazy things happened. Something crazy happened that was good. Um, so the, the speakers we have tonight, today, are Wee Ki Bing and Liu Chin Tong. Wee Ki Bing, who will speak first, will talk about how this amazing result came about from his point of view. Ki Bing is the executive director of the Penang Institute. That's a, uh, the think tank for Penang State. He's a sinologist who has translated Sun Tzu's Art of War. And he is an expert in nation building and Malaysian politics. He'll be followed by Liu Chin Tong, who's the newly appointed deputy defense minister of Malaysia. Uh, he was a, also, before that, leading into the election, a key strategist for the coalition that won power, an MP for 10 years, and an MP who led a strategy which included challenging an almost unwinnable state, which in the end he actually didn't win, but he's still here as a minister for us today, so there, some things can end up well. Before we begin, I'll just have a few housekeeping announcements. Firstly, of course, please, um, while you continue enjoying your lunches, if you could put your phones to silent. And afterwards, when we do questions and answers, if you could identify yourself before we recognize you to take a question. Secondly, I'll just mention very briefly that we have a couple of exciting events coming up. Next Thursday, we have a screening of a movie called Better Angels, which is about the China-US relationship and how it could be not as bad as the current trade war seems to suggest. And then the following Thursday, we have Christine Lowe, who we all know, I think, uh, and uh, Richard Cullen, talking about how we could write a new Hong Kong story. So those are two events that are coming out. They're actually selling out fast, so if you're interested, do sign up. Um, without further ado, I'm going to pass the podium to our first speaker for this afternoon. That's uh, Dr. Wee Ki Bing. Okay. Hi. Thank you, Douglas. Hello, everyone. Good day. Um, I'm very, very happy to be back in Hong Kong, one of my favorite places to come for food, among other things. <laughs> now, um, and thanks to the FCC for, for giving, giving me and my, uh, our Deputy Defense Minister the space to speak to all of you today uh, on perhaps one of our, maybe our favorite subject, <laughs> uh, the, the changes that have happened in Malaysia. Now, what I'm going to say will not be so much about uh, how the change came, but but actually to answer the question, what what it is that that actually happened, right? Um, so being a historian, basically, so I would I would use historical approaches to to describing the or to to give you the significance, the way I see it, of what actually happened on May 9th this year. Uh, now we could of course start by. Uh, periodicizing it very sh sh shortly, so just look at the election itself as something rather unique, an aberration almost, and then that way would, we would be looking at what happened the way a reporter might look at it, you know, the blow by blow as it were, Mahathir appearing, started his party, getting into to coalition with Anwar, and all the strategies that, that he, he you know, all the tactical moves he made that actually worked out and how he, he he could turn enemies into allies and whatnot. And of course, that that's what most of us would have been reading over the last six months, if not more. Uh, but that's that's the short version of it. That's the, so there is that significance, of course, uh, and that in, in itself does say quite a bit about, about Malaysia and where Malaysia is at at the moment. But that wouldn't be the whole story, far from it. Um, so I would go somewhat beyond that to start with and talk of what has happened as the, a tale of three elections. 
that would be one easy way of looking at it. We have to go back to 2008 uh, when the the voting the voting population in Malaysia suddenly against against most people's expectations actually voted not so much for the opposition they voted against the government um, and I think uh, YB Liu would agree with me even in Penang where, where the opposition became very strong that people were voting because voting for the opposition because uh, they couldn't just couldn't vote for the ruling party back then and then that was enough for the the central government to lose five five states in in and that came as a big surprise um, but by 2013 we saw that the opposition could only retain two three states if we can come if we bring in kelantan so things were not going all that well really so things were you know dying out down somewhat but during the elections itself in 2013 we saw that the popular vote actually went up for the opposition so certain things had been going right for the opposition uh, in states like penang and selangor these uh, opposition states the state government in both one largely run by the dap and selangor largely run by the pkr had shown that they could they could maintain themselves they had enough good people to actually run a government well enough and much more cleanly than the the uh, old governments had done so the popular vote actually did go up partly thanks to many malaysians living overseas actually paying for the fares and whatnot and rushing home to to uh, vote against the federal government i remember i was in johor Bahru, far to the south uh, just on the other side of singapore and uh, there you can see anyone who had been to the voting station and come up with that mark on their finger uh, would be given free meals not by any any party but by people by just people who, who own shops and who want who wanted to welcome back for welcome all these people back who who came all that way from wherever singapore <laughs> Hong Kong, even even London, I think, just to vote, just to throw their vote. So you could see the enthusiasm there, but that didn't carry the opposition all the way into into Putrajaya. Um, so that's the second uh, second election, right? As the third one started coming, 2018, um, we could see that uh, there was a flagging in the enthusiasm until certain things started happening i won't go I, I think i have only 10 minutes right so i i think i'm giving too long a, a story on this uh but we, we saw in 2018 that um the opposition finally pulled it off right uh, with the help from their old nemesis mahate muhammad strange story but uh, if anyone does that kind of writes that kind of fiction no one will believe them but uh, it happened in real life right now that's what and one way of looking at it the other is to look at the period we're talking about uh, we could go from i would say to 2003 to 2013 as the non mahate years right <laughs> Uh, the, the inter Mahathir period, really. That, that period in modern Malaysian history that Mahathir wasn't Prime Minister. <laughs> um, so one could look at that and so we see a rather dismal record. So without Mahathir, we don't seem to manage very well. <laughs> you know, to the extent that the opposition became so strong. That's, so that does... I mean, one could discuss this and see why, why that was so. Um, or one could go back slightly further to 1998 when Anwar Ibrahim was uh, sacked and he refused to go and he took to the streets and he, he managed to put his finger on this, the, the sympathies of the time and he started, he became the lightning rod for a movement we call the Reformasi movement um, that started in 1998 and the movement that now took power take, has taken power this year, one could see it as something that started then with the sacking of Anwar Ibrahim and what that ignited in a new generation of Malaysians. Uh, that would, to me, explain much more deeply what has happened because it, also, it can also explain why Mahathir was needed, why he could come back. Because it wasn't about parties anymore, it was a social movement <coughs> that the opposition very quickly could put itself as the front for. Uh, and in the end, Mahathir 
came to the same conclusions about the BN government and, and managed to, to, to join up with the Anwar faction and even become its leader. Um, so I'll go quickly a few more. If one could go back a bit more to 1990 when Mahathir, after a very difficult decade in power, came up with the idea of Bangsa Malaysia and Vision 2020, which which were very well accepted by a large section of, of the Malaysian population, I would say. And he was lucky because at that time, that was also when the whole of East Asia was rising economically. Uh, and so he could ride on that wind as well. So he, he was lucky in many ways. Uh, he got his act right. He gave the right rhetoric at the same time. And so we, we saw Malaysia having the fastest growth only after China, I think. Right, about 10% for quite a few years. And making Malaysia a, a household name in many countries as the champion of the third world and all that. Um, so if we look at that, and Mahathir now joining up with Anwar, so it's a, a merging of the of the, virt the values of the 1990 Vision 2020 with Anwar's reformacy values, in a way. They're they coming together, and they're not all that different. So I think we're, we're seeing what will come out of this new government will be a rhetoric that will be a mix of, of these two, I think. Um, we could we'll go back a bit further, back to 1969, when we talk about the new Malaysia today, right? It's actually New Malaysia 2.0. We had New Malaysia 1.0 in 1970 when after a, a bloody election, an election followed by bloody after an hour, a bloody aftermath we we had huge reforms carried out in uh, in the name of affirmative action for the majority Malays and that changed the whole of Malaysia so in, in the way one has to see these two together a new Malaysia 1.0 followed by a new Malaysia 2.0 after 50 years a kind of Hegelian swing a, a, you know a dialectic there that's one another way of looking at it or one could go back slightly more to 1963 when Malaysia was formed with the joining of Singapore, Sabah, Sarawak. We know today, 2013, 2018, that uh, Sabah and Sarawak are rather, rather optimistic that they may perhaps get back some of the rights that they thought they, they hadn't given up when they joined the, the Malaysian Federation. So that, that's another look at it. From the, from the point of view of East Malaysia, what happened this year is also their battle. Their battle that goes from 1963 until 2018. Um, or one could go back to 1957, of course, to the beginning of Malaya. Uh, and that we, we, are, we are coming to the end of a transitional period, of a certain period in Malaysia's nation building, something that perhaps had to happen. And even if we see it that way, we have come to the close of a chapter. And what, what is this new chapter that is being written? I think that's what uh, YB Liu will be talking about after me. Or, finally, last point, uh, we could go back even further to 1946, the starting of UMNO, when Malay nationalism was born and became a serious force for the Malaysian community, Malay community. It, that was when their political awareness and their cohesion began, and all symbolized by Amno, who then went on to get independence and ruled the country up until 2018. So we are clearly seeing a period being closed. The Amno period just ended, May 9th, 2018. So we are really, really in a new phase in Malaysian history. I think I better stop. I'm sure I've used up my 10 minutes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Douglas. Uh, Consul General the Tunku Siraju Zaman, uh, friends and fellow Malaysians. A very good afternoon to all of you. Uh, this is my, well, if I don't count my visit to Singapore, this is my first private holiday in a year and a half. But uh, Douglas make it a bit pu public <laughs> with this event, which I'm ha very happy to be here. Uh, we worked very hard in the last year and a half because I thought it was possible to win power. 
uh, although most people don't think so, didn't think so. Uh, and after election, uh, we also work very hard because we have a prime minister who worked quite hard. And for those who are nearing retirement, uh, you can come to Malaysia because uh, retirement age is now set at 95. <laughs> Uh, today I want to talk briefly on the meaning of this election and the way forward. Uh, perhaps we can have more changes later during, during the discussions. But what was the major message on 9 of May? I think the major message on 9 of May is that Malaysia is now a democracy when, where in which in future elections fear would not be a factor or fear would not be a tool that can be used by the ruling party. Up until this election, there was always the fear tactic in, in every election, but it didn't work this time. It didn't work for many reasons, uh, but moving forward, Malaysia is now a new democracy. And that, I think, will have meanings and implication for the region and beyond. This is uh, against the international trend of a democratic decline or deficit. And I hope in the years to come, we can build on the democracy that we, we have won in this election. What bind this government together? I think there are many talks about uh, this government not being a stable government, this government will not last for very long. But what bind this government together? I think it is the shared adversity against dictatorship. Now, many people still think that Mahathir uh, is a, or was a dictator. But mind you, actually Mahathir was also a victim in the last three years at the hand of Najib. Although Anwar suffered at the hand of Mahathir. But this shared experience of being, at the op oppos being in the opposition, opposing a prime ministerial dictatorship will be the main binding factor of this government. If you look at the choice of uh, governor of Bank Nagara, if you look at the choice of the MACC, Malaysian Anti-Corruption Commission, if you look at the, the re reinstallation of uh, the special run chief, they were all fighting Najib at the height of Najib's power. They were trying to investigate 1MDB and some of them had their life being threatened. Some of them had to run away. And I think this will be the common binding factor that brings this government together. And I think, let's say in two years' time, uh, let's say when Mahathir retired in two years' time, ironically, he will probably be remembered as a Democrat. He will probably be remembered as the, the person who democratized, democratized the institutions in Malaysia. And the democratization of institutions or institutional, institutional reforms in Malaysia perhaps will be the major success of this government. And you have seen this already. Uh, the Anti-Corruption Commission is now placed under parliament. The Prime Minister no longer has a huge economic portfolio. The economic portfolio of the Prime Minister Department is now placed under Minister Asmin. Uh, you don't have a Prime Minister who is also a Finance Minister. The new Finance Minister is Lim Guan Ning. And at all level, we are trying to reform the institutions. I think that will be the common binding factor. But also because of the way politics was structured before this election, Mahathir had to reconcile with Anwar. For someone who devoted my entire adult life on the opposition bench, uh, I joined, I became very active in 1998 when I was 21. I'm 41 this year. Um, and I was elected in 2008. For my entire adult life, it was Mahathir versus Anwar. It was, uh, it was about reformacy. And I, at one point, I called myself uh, the reformacy generation. I had a small book called uh, Speaking for the Reformacy Generation. But because the way it was structured, Mahathir, in a way, was forced to reconcile with Anwar. And the, the opposition at that time, Pakatan Harpan knew that without Dr. Mahathir, Najib would still be there forever. It was very difficult for Mahathir and Anwar to work together. Very difficult. 
But it was also very difficult for the DAP, Democratic Action Party, my party, to work with Dr. Mahathir, because Guan Ning and Kishyang went to prison during Mahathir's time. I still remember on 4th of March, 2016, Mahathir quick up more on 29th of February, 2016, and on 4th of March, he had a press conference to call for citizens' declaration. The day before that, I was with a very senior UMNO, ex amno minister, and he said, I was trying to call Mahathir frantically, trying to ask him not to sit in the same panel with Kishyang. And at the same time, in our own party, everyone was trying to call Kishyang, you must not appear with Mahathir. But Mahathir and Kishyang saw that without this reconciliation, without this realignment, Najib would continue to be Prime Minister. And then this, in a way, uh, it's a closure to a 20-year chapter, and hopefully it's the start of a better Malaysia. I was at the National Day celebration when, when we attended as Minister and Deputy Minister. Anwar was seated as the spouse of the Deputy Prime Minister, and uh, Mahate was there as Prime Minister. So I went up to Anwar and asked him, I said, Dr. Sri, this is your first National Day celebration since 1998, right? Two days after 1998 National Day celebration, Anwar was sacked as Deputy Prime Minister. I think this coming together of Mahathir and Anwar helped us to close the chapter and also hopefully bring a different Malaysia. And for those who worry about Malaysia, I say as long as Mahathir and Anwar do not fight, uh, the rest doesn't matter. You will have a stable government. You also have a stable government because UMNO is not able to present uh, a cohesive coalition. As long as UMNO does, doesn't cut with Najib, as long as UMNO still embrace Najib, UMNO will, will go nowhere in politics. It has to cut with Najib, but it is not cutting with Najib. And UMNO is now thinking of working with PAS, thinking that by working with PAS, it combines religion and ethnic nationalism. But that also won't work. Why it won't work? Because very few people realize this, but this is actually a fact. If you read the, the demographic, demographic data of Malaysia, 70% of Malays are living in urban areas. Now you talk to any reporter, they may tell you, oh, Malay, Malays are rural people. But actually, 70% of Malays are living in urban areas. Living in urban areas do not mean that you are liberal. And especially do not mean that you are liberal by Western standard. I think that, has to, that caveat has to be there. But it means that someone who is living in urban areas, they are not plugged into Amno's rural community service politics. Um, what is Amno's strength? Amno is strong as a rural community service center. Uh, say, for instance, in Johor, which is an Amno stronghold. When someone's family, someone's parents pass away, Amno will be the first to come to pray and set up prayer, set up funeral. When someone's trying to get married, Amno will be the first to offer a canopy for you to rent at a cheap rate. These are all important to rural communities, but it has nothing to do with urban community. This election essentially it was a WhatsApp election. The 2013 election was a Facebook election. The 2008 election was an SMS election. <laughs> I'm describing facts. Uh. <laughs> so this election, a lot of undercurrent actually was transmitted through WhatsApp. And when you are an urban population, you are plugged into national conversation. So this election was an election against Najib. And I, I always tell my friends and uh, comrades in my party, I say, we have to be very humble that we were not, well, the Malaysian did not vote for us because they like us. Malaysian voted against Najib and Rosma in this election. Likewise, how to interpret past gain in Kelantan and Trungganu. Past won handsomely in Kelantan and Trungganu, not because voters in Kelantan and Trungganu voted for past. It was a vote against Najib and Rosma via PAS. 
because workers in Kelantan and Trigano figure out that it will not be easy for Pakatan Harapan to to win against Najib in Kelantan and Trigano. So I think the election has to be inter interpreted in this way. But anyway, moving forward, while we know that there are consensus in terms of uh, institutional reform, Malaysia under the new government will have to work out ideas on economic reform. Uh, we have different ideas because we we'll, have well, people have different ideas and we need to build a consensus on what to move forward for the economy. And we will still have to deal with identity politics. But as Kibing pointed out, in 1991, actually within the context of Malaysia, between 1991 and 2005, we had relative cohesiveness among races. Because during that period of time under Mahathir, the idea was to have this idea of Bangsa Malaysia under the context of Vision 2020. The idea is simple. You have economic growth, you have sharing, and you don't, you, well, during that period of time, uh, Mahathir finally fought with any other people around the world, but not, not Malaysian, uh, not within, within uh, or not inter-ethnic within Malaysia. So at that point of time, uh, it was US, it was UK, it was uh, the Jews, it was uh, uh, the most com Australian and the most convenient uh, Singaporean. <laughs> but of course, hopefully, in the years to come, we can build a more cohesive Malaysian nation under the context or with, within the context of a Bangsa Malaysia. And that's my hope for Malaysia. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Minister, and keeping and and also for keeping it short. This means we have a little bit more time for questions. Um, as I mentioned, if you'd like to ask a question, if you could raise your hand and identify yourselves when you are called. Um, yes, Florence, maybe you'd like to take the first question. Uh, just to start, Florence de Changier, report for uh, Le Monde and the French National Radio. You touched on the 2020. Uh, at the time when I was reporting in Malaysia, it was already a joke. Some people were saying it means 20 big and 20 small when you play the local lottery. But of course 2020 is the big project of uh, Mahathir to make Malaysia a developed country. Uh, we're two years away. Um, can you tell us about it? Thank you. The last time we hosted uh, APEC was in 1998 when Algo came. Uh, we're going to host APEC in 2020. Thing comes uh, in a full circle. But I think uh, we'll have a very unique situation where uh, Mahathir will lead Malaysia into 2020 in a very bizarre uh, drama worthy of uh, world movies. But economically, I think if, if we talk about economy, I think we will we'll have to rethink where we are, how we deal with the world uh, in the years to come. We used to be uh, a, a nation dependent fully on foreign direct investment. But today, actually, Malaysia is exporting capital in many ways. So we will have to think of how to be juicy uh, in terms of investment into Malaysia. And at the same time, we will have to deal with these questions of uh, having huge number of unskilled foreign labor in our system. And that has, in a way, depressed wages. So you have young Malaysians working in Singapore, uh, yet we have huge number of unskilled labor from Bangladesh. Wages in Malaysia is set in Bangladesh and Singapore, not in Malaysia. Now, how to deal with this? Uh, how to move the economy and how to upgrade the economy? I think these are issues that we will have to grapple with and this is not going to be easy. There will be winners, there will be losers, and there will, be, there, will, there will have to be new ideas and new formulas. But in terms of national identity, I see an opportunity within the context of 2020. 2020 talks about economic growth, economic, being an advanced economy, but at the same time, we also talk about ethnic relations. Uh, instead of seeing Malaysians as Chinese, Malay, India, Indians, uh, whether there is an opportunity to see ourselves as a Malaysian nation. And hopefully that will be something that we can work on and that will be something that uh, we can reach 2020 in relatively favorable terms. Uh, 
thanks very much. Mark Michelson, IMA Asia. Fascinating political story. I'm not going to ask you about that, but I think you've, you're, you've got another movie coming at the FCC that might be on the election of Malaysia in, in 2018. I want to follow up on what you were just saying about uh, foreign policy, especially in the region. Uh, Prime Minister Mahathir, when he was Prime Minister before, had a look east policy, uh, which, which we all know, and was pr pretty defiant. Mr. Najib also had a look east policy, although he's looking mostly at one country, China, and it was part of the way the Belt and Road. This became a controversial issue, partly in the election and going forward now in the early days of the Mahathir uh, administration. What do you think about what's going to, what do you think is going to happen? How important was this in terms of the election, the relationship with China, and uh, how does it look to you going forward? Well, I think uh, both Mahathir and Anwar are internationalists, and here when I'm, the reason why I mentioned Anwar is that Anwar is going into a by-election, and eventually I think the Mahathir Anwar uh, combination will be will be important for for the years to come. I think both of them are internationalists, and both of them held on to some idea of Malaysia having an independent foreign policy outlook. Uh, I think it is not wrong to say that Malaysia aspired to be a middle power. Malaysia aspired to be one that punch above its weight. And it is so during the early 90s, uh, during Mahathir's time, in that period of time. And I think we we'll remember ASEAN ha having Ramos, Mahathir, Suharto, and Lee Kuan Yew. And that was a period of time where ASEAN was able to, to drive agenda. And not to forget that it was Mahathir who brought, who brought China back into international arena after Tiananmen, uh, when when Mahathir created, or, or together with Suharto, created uh, various ASEAN dialogue processes that included China, and it was important to China. Of course, moving forward, Malaysia would want to see itself um, with a, a bit more room, and not being seen as anyone's client state. Uh, we, I think the equal distance is important. Uh, well, I think. Chinese leaders take comfort in Mahathir not being pro-U.S. I think Chinese leaders took comfort, comfort in that, that he's not pro-U.S. At the same time, uh, well, I met uh, Foreign Minister Wang Yi, I met some of, the, some of the ministers who came from China. The message is very clear. China acknowledged that there were problems in some deals. I think that it's very clear that China acknowledged that there were problems, but China is also very clearly indicating that it wants to move forward with a more comprehensive relationship between Malaysia and China. I think there are still plenty of room to collaborate, and with the current mood in China, I think uh, I, I think the current mood, if I re read it correctly, is more reflective in China. Uh, as as a result of trade war, I think there'll be a lot more a lot more room for Malaysia and China to work together in this context with mutual respect, with mutual respect uh, in the context of uh, post trade war, uh, in the context of China being more reflective on its approaches uh, to Southeast Asia. I think uh, I I'm positive about our relationship. Uh, what do you think, uh, sorry, Nick Thompson, no affiliation, uh, what effect do you think things like the missing aircraft, the one that got shot down, and the way that the Malaysian government handled those incidents also affected the outcome of the election? I'm not sure whether there's any direct consequences. Of course, it adds to the perception that the government was uh, was incompetent, the government was uh, was not concerned about issues, but whether it has a direct consequence on the election, I'm not very sure. My name's Steve Vines. I'd just like to ask either of you the obvious question. Why is it that you now trust Dr. Mahathir? He has spent the majority of his life, as you know better than most people in this room, persecuting people of different views, showing an authoritarian attitude. 
Um, he may well have reconciled with Anwar, but that's quite recent compared to his history. And can I just ask you as a, a supplementary question, what do you feel about the fact that your head of government is, an, is a racist? I mean, he's an unrepentant anti-Semite. Do you feel this is something you are comfortable with coming from a multicultural society? Um, well, well, you, you know the usual line about who who is it that makes history? Is it uh, is it movements or is it people or is it you know the the hero uh, way of approaching history? I I personally tend to go with the movement uh, or, or that both of course are involved. Uh, I think we should not forget the reformasi movement. I think the major, major movement in Malaysia since since the fall of Anwar from, from Greece in 1998 had been that it generated for a new generation of, uh, of, of Malaysians who did not succumb as easily to to fear-mongering as people of my generation, I think, because we actually did have racial riots and whatnot. The new generation, and I think YB Liu would be of that generation, they, they seem to take more for granted than people of my generation, perhaps Mr. Chia might agree to the, with that, that was three. Uh, they, they think of it as their country, I think the new generation. Um, and I think Mahathir, I mean, they, they were all against Mahathir, of course, in the 1990, 1998. But again, the tale of the three elections, we do see a certain, a certain, certain build-up of opposition to the to the BN, and B, the BN, this this creature, if I use, use use that word, because it had captured society and the civil service and all the institutions to a large extent, uh, had to go. I think that was the, ma the main concern of most people of that generation who were in the opposition. Uh, but by the time the third, gener the third election came along, uh, there was before Mahathir reappeared on the, on the scene, I think there was a great sense of de re dejection. People were, were feeling very unsure that Anwar could pull this off or that his movement could pull it off at best. 45% of the population might vote for them. Uh, the foreign Malaysians do not seem to show any enthusiasm about coming back again. Um, and I think, I remember I, I did discuss this with uh, YB Liu quite a bit, because that feeling was quite, quite clear. Uh, and it was also, I think, in, in, that, in that context that uh, Mr. Liu thought that uh, the key was to go for Johor. The opposition had to show that it, this coming election was going to be an offensive one, not a defensive one. And after being in power in, at certain levels for two elections, there was a strong sense that the opposition coalition was getting a bit comfortable. They were no longer willing to, to fight. They were more defensive than offensive. And that, I think that was in that context that certain people in the opposition thought they should, they had to had to go on the offensive, uh, it's a do or die. It's a do or die. There won't be a fourth election. The third one had to be won. Uh, and in such a, such a condition, I think uh, many leaders, I think YB Liu would be among that, you have to use whatever means come along. It's, it's become totally polarized. Either you win or you lose. And when, if you lose, you'll probably end up in jail. There might nev no, never again be an election. And the ethnocentrism of Malaysia would go even further. It is that context of uh, do or die, I think, if you would agree. And that is where Mahathir appears. Now, was Mahathir feeling the same thing? Um, I don't know. But uh, I think he, he did feel that he had to get into the act. I mean, we're talking about a 91, 92 year old man at that time. Uh, and I think the DAP was quite fast in seeing that well, this is the person we need. Uh, otherwise, you, you, either, you either play safe and not win the election, or you take your chances. And I think they, they decided to take their chances. Um, Anti-Semitism in Malaysia itself is not of a daily consequence, if, if you know what I mean. Um, and so it's for most people who are even now supporting Mahathir, it, the, the thing is about Malaysia, it's about domestic domestic politics. Can we, can we change the direction of Malaysian politics? And if this old man can help us do it, and it looks as if he is the only one who can help us do it, 
uh, how can one say no to it? I think that's that's how most most would have been thinking. I think we trusted the mutual agreement that we reach. We negotiated every step in terms of collaborating with Mahate. And the government is not a Mahate government, but a Mahate Anwar government, a Pakatan Harapan government. And this government is a congregation of, I would call the four traditions, uh, uh, signified by four personalities, Mahate, Anwar, Lim Kisiang, and the late Nick Aziz, represented by Amana, the, the Amana party. Now, four of these individuals, Mahate, Anwar, Kisiang, and Nick Aziz, uh, were very influential beyond material politics. Each of them, in the last 50 years, had their worst time, uh, their worst uh, election outcome, but yet still retained sizable support of diehard supporters. Anwar went to jail, but he still had a following. Mahate was not in office, but he still had a following. Uh, Nick Aziz had a following. Kisyang had a following. And this is a congregation of four traditions, of four very popular traditions coming together. I think we see beyond Mahate the person. And I, I don't like to see this government just as a Mahate government. This is a government of Mahate and Anwar. It is a government of Pakatan parties. I think there is one, one other point. That the, the greatest advantage uh, I see in Mahate is that he's 93 years old. <laughs> I mean, seriously. Uh, so how much damage can he do? You know? <laughs> um, I, I think that was a consideration for some. Yeah. OK. We're having a very good discussion, but unfortunately, we've only got a, a, another eight minutes by my clock. I see a lot of hands up. Um, I'm going to take a woman, uh, the woman over there. Okay. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, my name's Ida. I'm from Malaysia. Um, one of my concerns, yes, is this understanding between Anwar and Mahathir that Mahathir will step down after two years and pass the torch to Anwar. But if Anwar wins the by-election and he's an MP, he could become the next Prime Minister. Would he shortcut this process? And then what happens to the dynamics between the two of them and the whole Pakatan Harapan after that? My short answer to that is that they, they, they were wrong in 98. Uh, they, they created a mess, both of them created a mess in 98. Uh, I think they will do it right this time. <laughs> okay, so one, f oops, sorry. Yeah, question over there. Yeah, my name is Jia. I, 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 I think it's an interesting discussion. Thank you, Dr. Oi and uh, YB Liu. Now, uh, because both of you were eyewitnesses to a very important piece of uh, our history, the history of the Asian region, I just have two questions that may add some color for the audience. The first is, did Najib seriously consider arresting Mahathir in the weeks leading up to the election? If so, will it change the course of the election? Second, why did Najib run away when he could? Uh, I I'm not sure whether whether Mahate, no, sorry whether Najib ever consider arresting Mahate. Uh, had he arrested Mahate, we would have won with a bigger majority. <laughs> I I did uh, when when uh, when during my campaign, Mahate's photo was not allowed uh, on poster on billboard. So we, we created a billboard with Mahate's photo at the center and my photo at, uh, on the left and uh, the state candidate of uh, Yong Ping's photo on the right. Because I told them, you cannot take my photo down. I'm a candidate, I pay a deposit, you have to, you have to allow my photo to be, to be there. And uh, some very smart people decided to cut Mahate's head out. And it actually angered many people. So I don't think Najib ever considered arresting Mahathir. Maybe there was someone, someone might have proposed it, but I don't think he has seriously considered that. Why Najib didn't run away, this puzzled me. Uh, 
<laughs> Seriously. Because I, I thought, of course, he, he and those people around him, up until probably about 10 o'clock in the evening, still thought that they had a majority. And from what Anwar say, uh, they communicated at 11 or so, 11 o'clock or so. Um, I think Najib was still hoping that even without a majority, he can stitch together a deal uh, in order to stay in power or at least uh, control the process, which he didn't, which didn't work in his favor. Okay, one final question from the uh, lady in the back there. My colleague from Bloomberg. No, no uh, bias at all. Yeah, no bias at all. Thanks, Doug. Um, Sophie Kamarudin from Bloomberg. I'm also from Malaysia. And as soon as I heard about the election, I, I got my flight, had to lock that down. Um, my question is with regards to ethnocentrism. Um, earlier, YB, you said that Mahathir may pull a bat, some, some magic out of the hat when it comes to ensuring cohesion on, the, on that front around racial communities, uh, that kind of thing, before 2020. But how can the political class avoid the uh, exacerbating ideological fissures when you have Anwar, for example, just recently warning about super liberals, and on the other side, you have Amno also perhaps um, encouraging more racial chauvinism. How do we avoid this? I feel that overall, we need to deliver economic goods to Malaysians at the bottom. We need to ensure that uh, Malaysia in the years to come is not a triangle society economically, where the bottom is bigger than everything else. Uh, we should at least move towards a diamond shape where the bottom is smaller. I think it boils down to economic security of most people. And given the context of 75% within the bottom 40, bottom 40%, are Malay Pumiputra, it's important that this government deliver economic goods to the bottom 40%. Um, I think we need a new discourse on the economy. Um, for instance, affirmative action shouldn't focus on equity. It should focus on employment. It should focus on decent employment. Now, if the society is feeling that economically they are living a decent life uh, across the board, then it will be, there will be less incentive for fringe activities and fringe ideas. And I think the way UMNO and PASS is moving at the moment, they are advocating fringe identity politics, which is influential. I mean, I don't deny that these ideas are, are creating divisions within the society. But looking back over the last 15 to 13 years, the uh, last 10 to 13 years, let's look back, for instance, when Hisham waved the Chris in 2005. And from then on, Amno moved to the right. Since then, um, they had propaganda agencies, they had Utusan Malaysia, and uh, they had e TV, TV Tiga uh, broadcasting the ideas of these propaganda agencies and Utusan Malaysia into the living room of ordinary Malays. But they still lost this election. Without these propaganda agencies, without this whole supply chain of, uh, of, fake, of fake news or news, and with a clear economic program, which we, we have yet come to a con consensus, I think we can uh, avoid politics being driven by, by identity politics. Thank you, everyone, for the fantastic questions. Thank you to our speakers for the fantastic uh, comments they've shared. I'm going to abuse my position in chair and take us a couple of minutes over, over the line by just asking a final question, a difficult one, which may be Ki Beng rather than Chin Tong as a representative of the government might, might like to take. But you gave us fantastic historical perspective how that this has been, that May 9th didn't just come about. It was at least 20 years, uh, a result of 20 years of struggle since um, Reformasi began in 1998. Um, I was there in 1998. Um, I was on the streets in Occupy in 2014. There were a lot of similarities. It's been a tw it was been a 20 year struggle in Malaysia to get the result that we saw in May 9th. What do you think about the people in Hong Kong who are struggling for what they hope is a better Hong Kong? And what lessons, if any, do you think 
the Malaysian experience has for them. I know that there are many pan-democrats who are very impressed by what you've achieved. Um, and this is a difficult question, but I would be interested to know your answer. That's the one to get me into trouble, isn't it? <laughs> Uh, well, the, the struggle, yeah, I, I mentioned 1998 and the struggle from there, you can see the Reformasi movement building up and Berse can be seen as part of that. But I think if you look at the DAP, uh, the, the struggle goes back to 1970 and Kit Siang fighting that system. So for someone like Kit Siang, it's actually a 40 year battle that he, his party now has won. But in the middle of that, of course, you have the, the, uh, the Malay split, if one wants to use words like that, between number one and number two in 97, 98, and, and so that's what you witness. Um, to answer, I, I don't know Hong Kong very well, but uh, if, if I, let me say this about Malaysia. I think Malaysia at the moment is quite an inspiration for the whole region, uh, including Hong Kong, as well, obviously. Uh, but there's some, why, why Malaysia is so important here is that Malaysia was the only country, I think, if I'm not mistaken, I, I don't know much about the Philippines, that at the point of independence was actually democratic. It had a full democratic system in place, uh, which means that Malaysians actually grew up knowing what democracy is, even if the practice of democracy wasn't as good as it should be, we, we could talk the talk. We knew what democracy was, we knew what it was meant to, to express and whatnot. So it's taken us 60 years to get there. Yeah? Uh, and I mean, in the meantime, academics have called Malaysia a semi-democracy, but never a full dictatorship, right? Because we had that base. Now, if in the whole region, if a country with that base cannot be a democracy, then what chances are there for Myanmar, whatever. And I think at this point, 2018, Malaysia does stand as a beacon for a Southeast Asian type of democracy, if you like. Uh, so I, th I think it does inspire a lot of countries close by, from Singapore on one side to Hong Kong on the other. Um, the, the Singaporeans are, of course, very interested. We have some here, I'm sure. Uh, what does this mean for Singapore? We have to remember that Singapore got its independence through Malaysia, right? It, it, the British wouldn't have given independence to Singapore if it hadn't been within Malaysia itself. But then it didn't work out. Two years later, they broke away. So very much they're a splinter group from, <laughs> from Malaysia as such. So they, they did also have a democratic system but uh, their style of nation building was quite different from ours. Malaysia had hinterland problems. Singapore never did. So you, you build in another way. Uh, Hong Kong, well, I, I don't conceive of it as a country, you know, for obvious reasons. Uh, so I, I, I don't know. Uh, I, I, you know, I don't know Singap uh, Hong Kong enough really to, to say how, how widespread is this wish to be independent and is it a pipe dream or... I'm know? not advocating independence by any means. So I got you into trouble <laughs> instead, sorry. <laughs> Uh, on that note, well done. Yes, this is what journalists I'm normally throw tomorrow. back at the questioner. Can, I, can, can everyone here join me in thanking our wonderful speakers today and thanking Malaysians for being a beacon to the region?